Thank you very much for inviting us. It's an honor to be here, and thank you for coming. So uh, we're going to have some uh, a couple of fun hours ahead, ahead. But before proceeding, just let me introduce myself. My name is Dennis. I am a head of academic affairs with Kaspersky Lab, and my colleague here is uh, Ivan. I can't pronounce the surname. Sorry. Um, okay. Okay, he, he'll tell it himself. Ivan, he is a senior security researcher with our great team. Great stands for uh, Global Research and Analysis Team, which is like a commandos in cybersecurity field. So he'll uh, he'll have some pre pretty good stories to tell about uh, the recent, the modern threats in cybersecurity, uh, the recent attacks, the uh, APTs, and so on and so forth. Uh, and before. Uh, uh, we, we'll proceed with uh, our small mini lecture. I just want to tell you about the few initiatives we have at Kaspersky uh, for the students. Um, so, uh, at the moment. Okay, so I won't bore you with uh, details about our job, it's not that interesting. But uh, this stuff, uh, I'll, um, I'll tell you a bit more. This is what we call Secured Cup. Uh, so we are um, in Kaspersky. We are strongly believe that uh, uh, well, the cyber criminals they know uh, no borders, as you know it. They, they, it's in international. Uh, they are uh, they are very uh, very well organized, and it's in an international community. And we are we believe that in order to to, to fight it, to to, to defend uh, our customers from cyber friends, we should build an international community as well. A very strong one, and these initiatives uh, basically they are uh, aimed at this at this very goal to build an international community of young talents in cybersecurity, or all, all the ones who consider uh, the possibility to build a career uh, in cybersecurity. So um, this is the first thing. This is our international competition, which is called Secured Cup. Uh, it's for the students mostly. So. Um, we have, uh, the, the, so wh why would you want to participate in it? Because uh, the winner will get $10,000 and possibly uh, the, uh, the um, opportunity to participate in, in our, like the most well-known conference, uh, SAS, which stands for Security Analyst Summit. Analyst Summit. Yeah, thank you, Elon. Uh, uh, this is so, uh, but this is a team competition. So, um, what you need to do in order to participate in it, uh, it's a two stage competition. So, uh, we, are, uh, we identified several new markets uh, in which cybersecurity uh, solutions will be of, of, of uh, high demand in like next uh, three to five years. This is IOT, Internet of Things, this is biotech, and this is uh, automotive and personal security. So uh, now we are looking for ideas to, uh, of products or solutions in cybersecurity which will, uh, uh, w which may uh, address the threats which the uh, things like smart city and I uh, Internet of Things uh, now have, which maybe Ivan will tell you a bit more about it, because he is an expert here. Uh, and um, if you have the ideas of the, of the products within these markets, then you just submit the, uh, the brief description of your idea. Uh, a team of three can participate, up to three pe uh, people, uh, because the, the finalists will go to Budapest uh, for, a final, uh, for, for a finals, which take place in the late of November. It's like th uh, 13th of November, um, and then uh, you submit your your idea at the, at this site. Uh, I will show it to you. In just a second. It looks like this. Yeah. So you just play security cup. You you just click participate. You leave your idea. Then we'll see. Uh, we'll look through it. We confirm it. Then you prepare a detailed um, description of your project. And then the, the jury, which uh, consists of the guys from Global Research and Analysis team, will uh, look through it and select the winner, uh, the finalist, and then we'll get you to the Budapest. So this is about it. If you have some particular questions about this initiative, you can ask me after the our uh, Saturday. And the second one 
uh, is Kaspersky Southern Aid Program. This, sorry, I can help but do this. <laughs> it's a very cool thing. So, the Southern Aid is um, an, uh, a Kaspersky initiative to build an uh, international uh, youth community. So, um, yeah, this is not like, it, it, it is called ambassador program, but it's not like the other ambassador programs you may, may have faced before. Because, um, what, why, why would you want to participate in it? Because uh, we give some uh, real tasks to perform in cybersecurity field. We give uh, f for the ones who apply and uh, who pass the selection test. <coughs> the selection because uh, we are inviting uh, people who have at least interest in uh, cybersecurity and know like the basics. So, um, this is not an invitation to get a job at Kaspersky, this is an invitation to um, cooperate uh, in the form of performing uh, separate tasks and, uh, and, get for, and you can get for it like, things like starting from prizes and merchandise if it's a simple, simple task and then the money for, for the other tasks and then maybe traveling for something else and well you can see uh, uh, more details here on this site. It is started. It is. It is already running. We have uh, cyber mates from 32 countries so far. So, it is an international community, and you are more than welcome to join if you want. So, this is so much for advertisement here. Uh, if you have some quick questions, I can answer it. Nope. Okay. So uh, now I'll pass the word to Ivan, who will gonna. Tell you what. <laughs> okay, so he'll tell you the, uh, the topic of our discussion today, and after that, we'll uh, get to the to the cybersecurity game right away. Okay. Okay. Thanks. So, yeah. my name is Ivan. Uh, I work for Kaspersky, and today I'm going to talk to you about the recent trends in targeted attacks. So. Uh, First, I'm going to uh, tell you a few words about who I am and especially who, uh, what, what the team I work for does. Um, so, as, uh, as uh, Dennis told you, we, I work for a team called the Great, and what we do is um, we work on basically APT research. So, I'm going to tell you in a minute what that means. Uh, it's a team that was created in 2008, and we are about 40 researchers spread all around the world. Uh, working on um, threat intelligence, research and innovation, um, etc. So b basically the only thing we do is R&D, we don't work on the antivirus software at all. Uh, we are tasked with finding what the new threats are, who the active actors uh, in, the, in the field are, etc. And we've worked on um, some pretty well-known groups such as uh, Equation, UQ, TeamSpy, etc. that you might have heard of at some point. Uh, if you have some questions about them, uh, feel free to, to ask me about them. Oh yeah, while I'm thinking about it, uh, <coughs> this is going to, uh, I like to, the discussion format, so if you have any questions during the talk, feel free to raise your hand and interrupt me. Uh, there'll be a Q&A at the end uh, if you want as well, but if something comes up during the, the talk, feel free to, to, just, uh, to just ask away. So, first, uh, this talk is going to, uh, to be in something like two parts. First, I'm going to give you a bit of uh, theory, theory about how we model threats and how we think about them and then I'm going to uh, go into a bit more detail on how they operate, how the, the various groups operate and what tools they, they use. Uh, so when it comes to modeling uh, I'm going to go back uh, a bit in time and talk about the situation uh, the way it was five to ten years ago. So this is uh, what we call the cyber threat pyramid. Uh, it's it's uh, a pyramid showing who the different uh, different categories of the actors that are active in the cybercrime world. So, at the top of this pyramid, we have the APTs. Uh, what we call uh, APT means uh, advanced uh, persistent threats. These are the well, the most sophisticated and advanced attackers. So usually they're associated with uh, nation states or groups backed by nation states. Uh, we see them as uh, groups having virtually unlimited budgets. Uh, and who are uh, you know, uh, working on the most sophisticated campaigns that we see. Just under them, 
There used to be cybercrime, attackers that are financially motivated and people trying to steal credit card information or uh, install ransomware on your machine, etc. And at the, end, at, the re at the bottom of the pyramid was the random internet noise, uh, which is uh, the, your usual spam, DDoS attacks, adware, port scan, etc. So uh, if you've ever set up a, a server somewhere and uh, launched a Wireshark on your server to see what traffic is uh, arriving to it, uh, I'm sure you've noticed how, much, uh, how many packets are reaching your servers that you haven't asked for. So this is the random noise I'm talking about. Uh, next to the pyramid, we also have the, what, what I call the known unknowns and then the unknown unknowns. The known unknowns are the thing that we know are happening but we have no real visibility into. So that's, this is, these are things that would require additional investigation or invest, additional capabilities to be able to investigate them. So this, these might include stuff like the um, zero day broker ecosystem. So we know people are selling zero days in the market. We don't really know who they are. Uh, we don't really know uh, how many they are and uh, the, all the prices. And well, we know it's happening, but we don't have enough information about that. And then there's also the unknown unknowns, which are the things we don't know about. We don't even know that we don't know about them. Uh, so it means we can't work towards investigating them. And part of uh, what the great team is trying to do is uh, make this unknown unknown circle as small as we can by trying to figure out uh, all the new attack vectors and all the things that uh, need to be investigated so uh, we understand the, the, the landscape better. So this is the situation now. Not much has changed except the one thing which uh, you might have noticed is that the line between state-sponsored attackers and uh, cybercrime has become, a bit, has become a bit blurred. The reason why uh, it's the case is that, well, uh, the more we discover about APTs or advanced attackers, uh, the more we publish about them, then the more people from the cybercrime world um, replicate these um, these methodologies. And when I say we, I don't just mean Kaspersky Lab, but also every person participating in the cyber security uh, field. Uh, every time someone um, publishes research on some particular group and exposes their methods, then of course uh, all the other uh, groups that are not using these, these methods yet are going to uh, read those reports with some interest and figure out whether they can adapt these methodologies for their own uses as well. And the funny thing is, this knowledge actually kind of bleeds both ways, uh, by which I mean uh, when you, uh, if you think about cybersecurity companies that have um, pen testing pro uh, activities or red team activities, then they also read all those kinds of reports and they all try to replicate them as well. And when they do, then they are going to write some tools, like maybe you've heard about the PowerShell Empire or stuff like this that are routinely used in pen, test pen testing engagements. And these tools are usually very well written and get reused by APTs themselves in the future. So it's really um, a, a circle that's feeding itself. Now, I would even argue that the line between uh, random internet noise and you know, cybercrime is blurring as well. Uh, the reason why I'm saying this is there was a case uh, a few years ago now where um, a, a hacktivist called Phineas Fisher, you may have heard of this guy, maybe not, Okay, there is a company called Hacking Team that sells uh, uh, commercial keyloggers and, uh, and backdoors to, uh, well, uh, they, if you ask them, they're going to tell you that they only sell them to uh, democratic governments, but in practice, so this is not something we can, uh, we can prove. Anyway, they got hacked by uh, some hacktivists, uh, and this hack was very interesting because it involved some zero-day research. Uh, you can read about uh, uh, all this attack uh, online because the attacker actually published everything he did to, to uh, get inside the company. So basically even people that used to be considered real random internet noise can now uh, mount very sophisticated attacks. So, while uh, I just told you that it's not that easy to uh, categorize attackers the way we used to, I think there's still um, a wide spectrum on which we can place, uh, we can place them depending on, on a few things which are, um, well, their individual methodologies, their objectives and capabilities. So first, I'm going to tell you a few things about uh, these uh, long-term operations. Um, <coughs> 
in, in which we're going to consider actors that are trying to get an edge in the geopolitical game or to gain some kind of technological hegemony. Uh, do, you, do you know what a zero day is? Maybe I should clarify this notion. When we talk about vulnerabilities, uh, we, are, we have different, different types of vulnerabilities. Um, when you read about a vulnerability online, usually uh, it's after the, the software vendor that's been affected that's had a chance to patch it. Uh, this is what we call a one-day vulnerability because it's announced uh, at least one day after the vulnerability is patched. Uh, the other case is when a vulnerability is disclosed online before the defenders have had the chance to get a patch. So this is what we call a zero day. Um, when, um, yeah, when we talk about uh, sophisticated actors, usually it comes with the idea that they have access to those zero day vulnerabilities and they gain access to them either by buying them from people who find them or by, because they have the, capability, the capabilities to find them themselves, which show that they are capable of doing uh, advanced R&D. So, um, let's talk about the technical <coughs> capability of those actors. So, they have unlimited R&D, so they can find zero days, they can, uh, they can develop their own uh, software backdoors, etc., <coughs> which uh, uh, takes a, a lot of time. C2 inside the victim network. Okay, C2, do you know what C2 is? C2 is when we talk about a, a backdoor, backdoors usually cannot operate themselves. Uh, there are very few cases where, where they can, such as uh, you may remember a, a case called Stuxnet for, from, uh, for 2010. It was a backdoor that was found in an Iranian power plant. Uh, obviously, the power plant was not connected to the internet, and the the, the Stuxnet virus had to be able to uh, do everything it had to do by itself. It, there couldn't be an operator behind it or remotely controlling it to uh, perform what it was programmed for. But usually, this is not the case. Usually, there is a backdoor or a virus that's deployed to uh, some victim's machine, and then an, at an attacker is going to uh, interact with this backdoor and tell it what it's supposed to do. The way this is going to happen is through a communications channel. Uh, this, is, uh, this is what C2 means. Uh, and the C2 is usually uh, set up through a server somewhere on the internet. So then the communications with, from the virus to the backdoor may happen through the DNS protocol, the HTTP protocol, which is not really important here. The idea is that for uh, these sophisticated attackers, they can get so deep inside the network that they can put their own command and control servers inside of it. Um, they have stealthy infection vectors, which means that the way they are trying, they are going to compromise the victim's network is going to be very hard to detect for the defenders. Uh, encrypted VFS means that yeah, the, the data they are going to steal from the victim is going to be stored uh, in a safe way. It's going to be encrypted. It's going to be really hard for the defender to figure out what's been stolen, even if they found uh, the dark data archive on the machine. Uh, what are the kind of entities that these attackers target? They are big corporations, telcos, governments, uh, embassies, uh, also uh, organizations that perform research, individuals, uh, well, individuals maybe an, a bit less, but uh, maybe some very important individuals. Uh, examples of those intrusion sets, I'm not sure this is going to be very enlightening for you, but these are some code names of various actors uh, that we are tracking. So there is one of them called Turla, Sauron, Another one is equation group, regime, etc., etc., and the final Lambert's as well. So these are the groups that we consider to be at the very top of the uh, cyber intelligence game. Finally, infrastructure. <coughs> they, well, I'm going to talk about the command control again. What they do uh, that's very interesting is contrary to what most viruses would do, which is establish connection to a server somewhere the, on the internet. They're going to find very creative ways to hide the virus traffic uh, in a way that uh, either is not going to be attributable to them or that is going to be very difficult for the defenders to uh, locate. Uh, one case that uh, was very interesting from a few years ago was a backdoor that would send their, that would bounce their, um, their notifications through uh, satellite uh, servers. <coughs> not satellite servers, but satellite uh, signals uh, so over in space. We have also seen cases where Attackers would send the traffic to 
IP addresses that did not match any existing machine, but they knew that the IP address, the packets were going to be sent in uh, in a zone where they would be able to intercept the traffic. So it meant that the defenders had n had no way to uh, go to a, some data center somewhere in the world and seize the, the computers uh, to perform an investigation because there was no machine there to uh, to locate. So this is the the kind of the kind of interesting. Um, uh, ways that uh, these attackers have been able to create uh, communications channels. Then we've got the the a bit less sophisticated groups uh, that would be uh, that correspond to what used to be uh, cybercrime, and or not not only cybercrime but uh, nation states with a bit less of budget. So these uh, these states would uh, typically have. Uh, limited uh, R&D capabilities, which means a limited amount of zero days, or even sometimes none. They would still use some homemade uh, backdoors, but uh, it's going to be a bit more simplistic. It's not going to be uh, as hard to find as, uh, as, a, uh, as a very advanced uh, rootkit would be. Uh, they would use standard intrusion vectors like uh, phishing. Uh, you know, do, you know, do you all know what phishing is? Yeah? Okay, uh, so I'm, I'm going to assume you do. Uh, they're going to uh, send uh, you know, um, uh, exploits uh, through documents, etc. But they won't have to be zero days most of the time. Um, these uh, entities are going to target uh, ISPs, uh, and diplomatic entities as well, NGOs, and sometimes uh, uh, dissidents in their own countries. <coughs> yeah, so when it comes to uh, various groups, uh, we have a few of them there, Common Crew. UPS, Blackbind, etc. So if you have any question about uh, them specifically, just ask them. I'm not going to go into too much detail because it's going to be quite boring, I'm afraid. Uh, finally, when it comes to the infrastructure, the, these attackers are going to, well, to use more standard protocols. They're going to buy some servers around the world, uh, typically in countries where we cannot seize them. So uh, jurisdictions that uh, would be very protective of customer data and where we would not be able to go and ask for, uh, for in customer information even though the malicious activity has been demonstrated. And finally, uh, we get to the, less, the other end of the spectrum where we would have um, actors that we suppose are uh, private intelligence firms or competitors among the same business sector that are hacking each other to get some uh, intellectual property. Um, so, yeah, those are going to use... Uh, uh, yeah, they, they won't have a lot of resources, so not many operators to control the, the back doors. Uh, they, don't, they don't have any R&D capabilities. They use open source software or reuse uh, public vulnerabilities that have been disclosed on the internet. And they use, uh, yeah, they use uh, open source intelligence to perform their initial reconnaissance. And they're going to try and hack companies and NGOs and yeah, usually non-governmental entities. So yeah, when it comes to intrusion sets, of course, this is very difficult to correlate. So these are actors that don't do a lot of things online, so it's not very easy for us to to correlate their various attacks because there there are not a lot of uh, a lot of them that we can um, that we can see. And yeah, when it comes to the infrastructure very ephemeral infrastructure, so they're going to buy servers, one-shot servers that are going to uh, last for a, a couple of weeks tops. Uh, they may not even use cryptography when they interact with it, etc, etc. So, where and how do these attacks take place? In order to uh, answer this question, I'm going to have to say a few things about the attack surface. So, there was a time when uh, securing a company would mean securing whatever's in the green <coughs> circle over there. So it used to be the company assets, which were a few servers and the client machines, and that was it. Uh, over time, it has expanded a lot. Uh, there was the, this BYOD, bring your own device movement, that, made, that meant that people, it was okay for people to bring their own uh, laptops or uh, mobile phones to, uh, and work with them. Uh, and what that meant as well was that uh, for attackers, attacking personal devices became fair game. Uh, there was a case uh, from a, a, a Belgian uh, telco, I think. Yeah, it's called a, it's a Belgian telco uh, that has been hacked. Uh, maybe not too long ago, a few years at tops, 
where the sysadmins of the company have been uh, hacked at home by the attackers so that the, the attackers could use the access they had from home to get inside the network uh, and, um, in, a, in a second time. So, uh, over time the circle has grown even bigger, which means that the, the personal email accounts or Twitter accounts, social, every, every social media account uh, can be uh, hacked and all these hacks can have an, influence, an impact on the, on the company as well. Um, and finally, we have all the, the, the gray circle that, that I've added at the end, which is uh, on the left the companies that you use, uh, the companies whose services that you use, and on the, on the right the companies whose software you use. And what I mean by this is there is a, a well, it's not exactly new, but it's uh, on the rise certainly, um, a new type of attack that's called a supply chain attack, where the attacker is not going to try and hack your company directly, but it's going to hack some software that you use or some company that you trust. And what this means is if you have some uh, IBM servers or uh, some uh, VPSs that you bought from OVH, then if either of those companies has been hacked and is either selling you backdoor servers or backdoor uh, machines, you are not going to be able to do anything to defend from that. And conversely, uh, if you, uh, I think most companies use uh, Adobe Acrobat or any kind of um, text editor. If any of them has been uh, compromised by an attacker, and it's very likely that you are, if you use them, you're going to be compromised as well because by default you're going to trust these companies. But by the way, I'm not saying these the, the companies that are depicted on this slide are shown that merely, merely as example. I'm not saying that. Uh, well, I'm really not saying that any of them has been involved in any incidents. This is just an example, right? So, there was a, a case in France, where, uh, it was maybe two or three years ago now, um, it was a broadcast, uh, broadcast group called Team 5 Monde, um, maybe you've heard about it because uh, it was a lot in, in, the, in the news. They, they got hacked, basically, uh, they were airing and then suddenly um, some, someone uh, destroyed their servers and they were not airing anymore. And after... Um, a big investigation from the French authorities, it turned out that uh, the initial breach had been made not directly from, uh, through the company, it was not made by direct attack, but through uh, a supplier that was uh, providing websites for them or something like that. And from that access, the attackers had been able to um, get inside the network of this broadcast group and then uh, destroy their servers. It was also an interesting case because the attackers had left uh, Traces, they had left evidence on purpose in the network to make it look like it was a traditional cybercrime. They had left open source backdoors that they were not actually using just to, uh, in the hope that the investigators would, investigators would think that it was a, uh, yeah, it was a run of the mill attack, which it was really not. So, why, uh, why has, have these circles broadened? Uh, one thing that uh, I like to say is we get the attackers we deserve, and uh, OSs have been hardened over time. What this means is that ever since Windows XP, uh, more and more protections have been added in Windows versions or even in uh, Mac OS or iOS versions that make it so that it's extremely co it becomes more and more complex for attackers to set up uh, to exploit vulnerabilities that are going to result in code exploitation. So. Attackers are not going to go through the pain of setting up a complex uh, you know, three-band attack for a company that's using um, XP machines, but if they have to, they probably will. Um, there are also uh, logical vulnerabilities that are still present in uh, a lot of software. Uh, for instance, I'd like to talk about this one called CPE 2017-0199. Do you know what CVEs are? Maybe not. Okay. Whenever there's a, CV, uh, a vulnerability that's discovered in some well-known program, well, like in Microsoft Office or Adobe Acrobat or Adobe Flash, um, a patch is released and there is also um, what we call an, um, a CVE number that is assigned to this particular vulnerability uh, in order to make sure that when the cybersecurity researchers are talking about a particular bug, they're all referring to the same one. Because uh, if we take the example of Adobe Flash, there had been like uh, 86 vulnerabilities patched uh, this week or maybe last week. So, if you want to refer to one uh, to a specific one, then you need to have some kind of identifier. And the CVE system, which is uh, 
run by an organ, an organism called the Mitre in, uh, in the US, I think, uh, is, is in charge of giving numbers or identifiers to all those vulnerabilities and make sure that uh, all of them are branded and that uh, everyone knows what they're talking about, basically. So this particular exploit is, um, is very interesting because it's not a vulnerability in itself, it's, um, it's closer to a feature that can be abused. So it's uh, present in uh, Microsoft Office, uh, I think it was the old, old versions at the time. The idea was you could craft the, doc the document in such a way that it would download scripts from the internet and execute it on your machine. So um, I think all of you have had some experience with <coughs> Word at some point in your life. So you um, open the Word document and you have had, you've seen warnings where you had uh, this yellow uh, this yellow warning at the top telling you that the document contains macros and that uh, you should click on it to enable them, right? Um, this is a mechanism that prevents uh, Word documents from executing scripts on your machine. Well, with this particular vulnerability, it was possible for an attacker to execute scripts on your machine without having this, uh, uh, this warning and, more importantly, without having the user to click on uh, allow a macro to run. So it was extremely... Uh, it was a very efficient vulnerability in the way that it was 100% reliable, there were no suspicious pop-ups, and uh, whenever the victim opened the document, then uh, things, uh, the game was over. So, yeah, this is one of the, this is the, kind of, uh, the kind of exploits that the attackers are going to use, and this is the kind of exploits that uh, red teamers are going to use as well. So, when such a vulnerability appears, what happens? Uh, someone makes an advisor in the internet and then people start writing on what we call proof of concepts. Basically, proof of concept is there is this vulnerability that, ex that exists somewhere in theory or that has been published and or patched and then someone writes code to exploit this vulnerability and to achieve code execution based on it. So this is what, this is, uh, these codes are called the proof of con proofs of concept. So a few days after this uh, CVE 2017-0199 vulnerability was published, you could just look online for the CVE number and find exploitation code. Uh, so if you look at one of those, for instance, um, if you look at the, at the code in uh, one of those exploits, we could see that there was an HTTP, um, an HTTP response that was, that was hard-coded. There. You might be wondering where I'm getting with this. So the idea is as defenders, we are trying to find ways to see what is exploited and when and to be able to detect maybe attacks before they happen. So when we see an exploit code that looks like this and when we see that there is a particular date uh, that's hard-coded in, in, the, in the exploit uh, on the server side, then the one thing we can do is we can scan the whole internet, look for web servers that reply with this particular date and then we know that all these machines that are located here are probably distributing or uh, trying to abuse this, this exploit. The, is, it, is the concept okay for all of you? Yeah, okay, so moving on. Um, there are some tools, uh, free tools online that allow you to perform such, such uh, searches. Uh, one of them is called Senses, the other one is called Shodan. Uh, basically, the, these are, uh, can, you, you could call them Google for, uh, for computers. So it's a, it's a website that allows you to look for all the machines online that have an Apache version 2.3 point, point something or that contain a particular value in their headers. So this is one of the things we can use to find all the servers that match a certain criteria and in this case find all the servers that replied this exact date that we had seen here because that would mean that these were servers very likely used to uh, exploit this vulnerability. Uh, one interesting thing was that among these IP addresses we could see servers that we had already seen associated with the activities of known groups like uh, the ones we call Confucius or Black Energy. So that meant that APTs had downloaded the exploits and were running them for their own operations. So, uh, you've probably uh, received spam at some point in your lives uh, everybody does, and most companies uh, receive a, an enormous n amount of it. So what the, over time, uh, most companies have installed some kind of protection uh, at, the, at the entrance of their network, especially on email servers. What they did was install send, analy analysis sandboxes, 
uh, etc. that would make sure that every email with an attachment would get thoroughly scanned. This, would, this just prevents uh, a lot of attack scenarios. And this means that a lot of these uh, scenarios that I, that I talked about before, uh, especially the one with the document sent over email, uh, probably wouldn't have worked in the case where uh, the attackers were talking to a company that had a sandbox at the, uh, uh, on the mail server. So yeah, a long time ago people would send executable files, uh, now that doesn't work anymore, try sending an exe file through Gmail and you see that it won't work. Re recently people, uh, well more recently, people started to send um, trapped documents, uh, either PDF files or doc files or XLS files, etc. And this is yielding less and less results, so now attackers are moving to a new uh, mode of operation which is just sending a link. So that link may usually point to uh, a web page that has been trapped and that uh, contains uh, an exploit for your web browser, for instance. Um, yeah, a few words about mobile, uh, mobile phones as well. Mobile phones are uh, a very interesting target for attackers. Uh, the reason for this is that the, uh, on the Android part, the Android ecosystem still lacks maturity when it comes to security. What I mean by this is uh, it's not that the OS itself is, uh, is not well coded or something like this. It it's just because there is a lot of fragmentation. Fragmentation means that uh, if you look at all the devices, the Android devices that are in circulation today, well, only uh, a very small part of them uh, actually uses the latest version of the OS. So what it means, if you look at the, the pie chart over there, uh, it means that there is only a, a small size, uh, a small slice that could be considered uh, up to date, up to date patch wise. So this is not something that's very helpful. There are economic incentives that uh, uh, that make this the situation so. Uh, basically, if your device is not updated for a long while, then you're more likely to buy a, a new one. Uh, there's also constructors that uh, do not want to patch devices forever because it's cost, it costs them money to uh, to work on the updates. So. Anyway, the situation is that a lot of Android devices out there are, are in a bad situation security-wise. There is also a prob there are problems with the, with the Play Store where there is uh, no, not much control on what is provided on the, on the Play Store, which means that uh, attackers have been known to upload malicious applications, and if you download them, then your phone gets compromised, and the applications may look like a well-known apps such as WhatsApp or stuff you'd use every day. <laughs> that being said, uh, iOS users are not entirely safe either. So the app, uh, Android, sorry, the iOS App Store is um, is, sick, is um, way more secure than the Android one because they have a very thorough they have very thorough checks on what they accept or not. Still, uh, there are companies like uh, Zerodium that are offering uh, more than a million dollars for an iOS 10 exploit, which means uh, an exploit, and that would, uh, if you send uh, an, a link or an or a message to uh, the target. Uh, the, the target only has to open the link or read the message to get, get compromised. So it happens. Uh, it can happen. It's very expensive, but uh, some attackers have been known to do it. For instance, a few years ago in the UAE, there was um, a dissident called Ahmed Mansour. Um, he, um, he was the target of one such attack, and uh, it was, uh, he, his phone was analyzed after he had received some suspicious link over, uh, over iMessage. And uh, the, the researchers discovered um, a, a chain of exploits. There were like three different exploits that were trying to, uh, from uh, a simple message, trying to achieve code execution on his phone and to, access to, to gain access to his uh, SMS or emails, etc., etc. So, so yeah, there's also a new trend that we've been seeing uh, quite recently is uh, actors using what we call MDM servers from mobile management, mobile device management servers to infect devices. Uh, mobile MDM servers are used by companies to uh, uh, to manage um, the 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 phones of their employees. This means that if you uh, if you work for a company and they give you an iPhone, then they're going to register your iPhone through their MDM server. Uh, so they are able to uh, manage it from a, from a distance. So they, they will be able to install apps for you or to prevent you from installing some apps if they want uh, the phone to be used for work purposes only. And we've seen attackers install their own MDM servers and try to convince 
a victim to uh, enroll to the, on their servers, which is going to give them the, the ability to push updates or push, maybe not updates, but push uh, applications, uh, applications that are going to give them access to the SMS, etc. So, yeah, iOS users are not entirely safe. Any questions so far? No? Okay. So, more on the threads. We're now, uh, if you remember the attack surface uh, diagram uh, at the beginning, we're now talking about circles three and four. So, what we can see is less attacks against you know, the direct uh, corporation network, but attacks targeting, um, um, you know, assets that are indirectly linked to the company. So, web, web applications, VPN, maybe uh, sometimes the email server. Uh, I talked about supply chain attack uh, uh, earlier, where the trusted companies of the victim are going to be uh, used as a Trojan horse to get inside them. Um, trapping legitimate servers. Yes, so this is uh, the case where you download software from a, a website you think is trusted, but it's actually backdoor mm -hmm. software that's going to install a malware on your machine. Uh, yeah, we've seen such cases in the past. The Microsoft published uh, a report in 2017 uh, where uh, a financial institution, uh, I don't know, in w I don't remember in which country anymore, I think it was Ukraine, um, a financial institution uh, had an IT team that downloaded uh, some text editor from uh, the website and uh, the website had been compromised so that the attackers, uh, the, the answers had been modified in a way that when the text editor would be installed on the machine, then a backdoor would be installed as well that would give access to the attackers to the corporate network. Um, so yeah, credential phishing, all the usual techniques. Typo squatting. Typo squatting is an interesting one. It's when uh, you try to abuse uh, typos on the keyboard. Uh, if, I if we have a, a website called kaspersky.com, um, it's possible for an attacker, if we haven't done it already, to register names that are close to our own domain. So, uh, Kaspersky with an, I, with an I in the end instead of a Y. And if someone makes a mistake when they type the URL or when they send an email, then the email or the browsing traffic is going to reach the attacker's server instead of the, the one that was your originally intended. <coughs> oh yeah, water holding. Do you know what water holding is? No? Okay, water holding is a, is a very interesting class of attack where uh, the victim, assume that the victim is uh, an organization with a very high security uh, posture, so it's not very easy to get inside the network from the outside. But if you know that their employees are going to browse to a particular website every day, like uh, if, they, if you know that every day at uh, 8 the employees are, are browsing to the guardian.com because they want to see the news or some, uh, some other website, and if that other website has a, a, a worse security than the organization they're trying to target, then it's possible to attack this website that people are trying to visit and put uh, your trap over there and, and wait for the employees to connect to that uh, server and to download your, your exploit or your, your trap. Is that, is that clear for you? Yeah, so okay, basically it's a two-band attack. Oh, it's also worth mentioning uh, a very nice, uh, very nice attack vector that is uh, USB keys. Uh, research has demonstrated that if you drop <coughs> USB keys in front of the company, eventually it's going to, be, it's going to, someone's going to plug it into a machine. Like um, I think people, uh, some researchers made a test when they dropped something like 40, key, 40 USB keys around uh, some company's premises, and maybe 20 of them eventually got plugged on some uh, some machine. So if one of those USB keys contain, or, or if all of those USB keys contain a, a file called a secret.pdf.exe, uh, it's actually very likely that uh, at somewhere down the road, somebody is going to try and double click on this application because they want to know what, what it does, because they, or because they think it's a document or something. So this is a, a very targeted attack vector, but it happens and it, uh, it works very well. So yeah, let me say a few words about the way we work and the way especially we try to um, write reports on different uh, groups or intrusion sets and how to try to link different attack campaigns to one another and to actors using uh, technical indicators. So the first thing I have to, to explain is that uh, once, an, uh, once a campaign has been discovered, it's usually, uh, it's usually easy for us to uh, find all the, all the victims. 
The way we do this is uh, when we discover that there, there has been an attack, we um, look at the machines, we, down, we find the malware that's been used, we download it, and then we analyze this malware, so which means we put it under the microscope and we see everything it does. And when we, when we find uh, something very singular about this malware, then we can create signatures. These signatures are, uh, for instance, uh, a string of bytes that are very characteristic, that are, that are only found in a particular sample. And once we have this, we can look at all the files that we've ever seen and try to see which of them uh, display this particular signature. And when it does, then we may have found a new variant or uh, another, another victim of, the, of this particular attack. So the, the way we work is through some kind of circle, which is uh, first we find something interesting to investigate, then we analyze the malware, we look for singularities, or for, uh, we look for the servers that the attacker is going to use, and then we do what we call the pivot, uh, which means we look for other cases or other attacks that share similar uh, singularities, and then we go back to uh, the first step. So by uh, uh, iterating like this, we are able to reconstruct uh, all the toolkits that are used by attackers, we'll be able to reconstruct all the servers that they use. And here in, in this particular example, this is um, this rule here is a, cri a cryptographic table that is used on a malware used by the, a group called Equation Group. So when we look at all the all the samples that present uh, this characteristic, we can create a map of all the places around the world where um, we've seen this uh, sample, we've seen samples that exhibit these characteristics and uh, we can start thinking about who might be behind this attack by uh, looking at what, who the victims are, what field of work they are uh, working into, etc, etc. So, the thing is, attackers also read the reports we write and uh, they do their best not to, uh, to be easy to correlate. So over time, um, it, they have shown to, uh, to they have shown capabilities to uh, get better at OPS, OPSEC, which is operational security. They get better and better, which means that they use burner servers. They only use servers once for one operation, and they don't use them again, uh, even though it costs them money. They do stuff called a geo-blocking, which is that they know that they're attacking people from this particular country, and if they get traffic from another place in the world, then they are not going to respond to this traffic because they know it's not the attacker, but maybe it's, they know they know it's not the victim, but maybe a cybersecurity researcher is trying to investigate the case. Another thing we've seen that is uh, more troubling for us is increased reliance on open source frameworks, which means that they don't even use their own tools anymore, which we can use to correct them, but they're going to download stuff from, for free on the internet and use them, and uh, they'll get lost in the mass of all the people that are trying to uh, use, the, that are trying, that are using the same tools because they are open source and free. To give you an example, this is a, a macro, uh, this is a Word document from a, a group called SoFacy or APT28. Uh, this is your run-of-the-mill uh, document containing macros with the, the warning at the, at the top. And if you uh, click on the macros and you see uh, the document gets displayed and at the same time you get a backdoor cell on your, on your system. This is not that interesting. What's more interesting is if you look at the code uh, that is uh, run by the attacker once the macros are enabled. Uh, I, I don't want to go too deep inside the detail of this code because, you know, You'll have a lot of uh, lot of time in your during your, your studies to write and recode. What I want to point out here is that uh, it's a bit rudimentary because the attackers here, even though they are a very sophisticated attacker, they didn't use uh, HTTPS, which means that the traffic was going out in the clear. That makes that makes it easier for defenders to uh, figure out that uh, something is going on. Uh, they there there is no proxy handling code. Uh, as well, and uh, the encryption they're using is uh, a bit poor, it's a simple XOR key. Uh, if you don't get all the de details, it's not very important at the moment. Now, if you look at the exact same code, uh, exact same code in the sense uh, that it does the same, uh, from the open source project called Empire that has, uh, you know, the, that offers users the capability to generate documents, then the code here is much more complex. Uh, it has, uh, a, it uses a, a user agent that's well known. Uh, it also contains, a, I think it's not shown here, but this one contain, contains RC4 encryption now, which is much better than a RC4 key. They have some proxy and handling code, etc. 
Uh, what, what I meant to show with, this, uh, with these two slides is that um, tools that are publicly available to anyone tend to get more and more sophisticated and tend to be even better than what the attackers used to do because the, they are the results, the, these frameworks are the results of uh, uh, countless hours of work from the free and open source software the community. So you have projects like uh, PowerShell you know, Empire, Metasploit, uh, Beef, which is used to perform uh, browser exploitation, etc. Et and this is a, a general trend where more and more open source tools or even legitimate tools like uh, Microsoft PowerShell or uh, system terminals are used by the attackers because they are, um, they are very hard to link to uh, a particular group. Uh, the reason for this is if I have to do an if I have to do an investigation on a machine and I find uh, a PowerSpot employer, employer or uh, some tools from the system tunnel suite that have been used for the hack, then it's very hard for me to, to get any information on who is behind the attack because anyone can get those tools anywhere. So, yeah, the, the cons is that since these tools are public tools, it's uh, more easy for antivirus software to flag them as malicious. But the, the pros, at least for attackers, is that uh, there's no way for the defenders to be able to correlate the virtual attack to them if they use, uh, if they use tools that, are, that do not belong to them in the first place. Okay, I'm going to, to start wrapping up. <coughs> Noisy targeted attacks are less and less common. Yes, this is a trend we've been seeing. Uh, well, attack and defense is a cat and mouse game, I guess. So it's not, uh, it's not, it shouldn't come as a surprise that uh, uh, the attackers are trying to be creative to, uh, to not be uh, discovered. So they try uh, to use uh, more and more open source tools and uh, more specialized infrastructure. So what they used to do in the past was use the same server to conduct a, a, a huge number of attacks. And now they try to use one server per attack, which is... Uh, um, which makes it harder for us to, uh, to create these attacks, of course. Um, that being said, uh, the fact that um, uh, these methodologies are evolving do not mean that uh, the companies cannot suffer from uh, all these, uh, these attacks, especially uh, uh, when, uh, with the high-profile case, high cases we've seen lately, like NotPetya, WannaCry. You guys have heard of WannaCry, right? Yes, of course. Of course you did. So, the idea behind WannaCry was some exploit from uh, allegedly the NSA has been leaked online and then some hackers allegedly from North Korea took that exploit and uh, you know, uh, duct taped it to a ransomware and then they uh, launched it on the internet and then the, the ransomware started replicating itself and uh, attacking more and more machines which, had, uh, which caused a, a lot of uh, financial losses. So, yeah. Um, and government great grants somewhere is coming. So, preventing intrusion is <coughs> preventing intrusion is pre pretty pretty hard, and pen testing experience shows that most companies are not able to provide a list of their IT assets because of either management issues, because of shadow IT. Shadow IT is the fact that you have some people in your organization that need some service and uh, don't come to IT to get it, but are trying to set it up themselves, buying servers and installing software, that happens. And it's very hard for companies to prevent that. Uh, turnover as well makes, uh, makes it so that uh, companies uh, may not know uh, what, which server does what uh, over the course of years. So, uh, stopping attackers at the gates may be something, uh, maybe a, a lost battle, I think. Uh, what is possible, however, is to uh, try and detect the attackers once they breach inside the network. So, think defense in depth. Uh, if, if someone were to breach your perimeter, what would you, how would you be able to figure it out? This is, I think, the, the question that uh, defenders should ask themselves nowadays. The thing is, while preventing intrusion is hard, it's also quite difficult for attackers not to leave any trace when they're inside the system because uh, everything you do on a computer, uh, well not everything, but most things you do on a computer that are interesting get logged uh, one way or another. Uh, the thing is, defenders, uh, are you reading the logs? Are you keeping them somewhere? Uh, if, uh, yeah, what about backups? If, uh, 
if you have an incident at some point, are you sure that you're going to be able to look at those logs? Uh, these are important questions that uh, you need to be able to answer. Yeah, so the, the final uh, message I'd like to give you here is that uh, hacking at its, at its core is an asymmetric capability, which means that um, a very small actor, that can be possibly even a single individual, is going to be able to, do, uh, to cause significant damage to uh, a big organization. Uh, uh, like large corporation or even bigger. So the only way that uh, this uh, asymmetric capability can be balanced is when defenders cooperate between each other. So there are a lot of communities online where you can share uh, details about attacks you've suffered, uh, like uh, uh, the results of your investigations. This is, uh, this is something we do at Kaspersky and uh, we co cooperate with a lot of other companies that uh, uh, help us figure out uh, how to detect attacks and also uh, give us information on the attacks they have suffered. And this is, in my opinion, the way that uh, we are going to be able to keep up, uh, keep up with attackers. Okay, so I think this about covers it for what I had to, to say. Do you have any questions, any comments maybe? Okay, no, this um, actually, uh, I might not have been clear enough on this. So these, these are two separate things. There is ransomware on, on one side, which is um, malware gets on your machine, and then it encrypts your disk, and it won't give you the key back unless you pay, or even if you pay sometimes. And there is another case, which was uh, the one I was describing when I was talking about sophisticated attackers, which is attackers steal stuff from your computer, they, are, they have a backdoor on your machine, they steal data from you, like your emails, your passwords, etc. And Yeah, but even when, as soon as they get their hands on it, instead of storing it on your machine plain text, they're going to encrypt it on your machine until they are able to, to send it online. Okay. This is what I meant. So, sorry about the, being not clear about that. Anyone else? Yeah. Oh, um, so if I understand the question correctly, is uh, which is the most likely to be targeted by sophisticated attackers? Is that um, small or large organizations? Is that it? Oh, well, it's, um, I don't think there's a way I could provide you with a definite answer on this one. The truth is every company is different and you'll have some very small companies that, have, that are very security conscious and that are going to have a very uh, thorough security policies and they are going to be very difficult to attack. On the other way around, you can imagine big companies that have an IT uh, infrastructure that's so big they don't even know who, what their servers are anymore. And those companies might have a lot of difficulties uh, defending their network. At the same time, you also have big companies um, that, that do security very well. So it's, it really depends on the particular victim, I would say. All right, well, thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you. Uh,